Coming up next, you've heard them all a million times or even more, the most overplayed songs of the 80s. Not only did they flood the airwaves back in the day, but since the neon decade, they've conquered pop culture media, getting played over and over and over again in movies and television shows. I'm talking about tracks like Journey's Don't Stop Believing," Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer, and Toto's Africa. We're kind of getting sick of them. I mean, I love them, don't get me wrong. But for today's episode, I want to give you six songs that are just as good and truly underappreciated. Uh, they made their mark on the 80s, but they've been missing in action since... That doesn't mean they're not outstanding. We got some real killers here. One hit song where a number one band forgot to credit a legendary writer for years. One that was produced by an iconic member of Pink Floyd. And one that might be the most chilling top 10 hit ever. Coming up, I'm going to count them down for you. See if you remember these classics. I know you will. And uh, see if you agree with my picks. Some great stuff coming up next on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember playing tetherball back in the day, it's where the ball is connected to the to, to the uh, the rope and you throw it around. You're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the red button and click the bell so you know, always know when our our, our uh, new interviews and new videos drop. You can also check us out on Patreon and check us out at our merch below. That helps us keep it a daily channel. You know, so back when I first started uh, this channel, this network that we have here, uh, I used to have this program called 80s Hidden Gems. Do you guys remember that? We had some early viewers that might remember that one. Well, today I'm going to return to that in a way I've got a special countdown for you. I've been thinking about these songs for a while. I want to give you my top six songs from the 80s that I believe should be the next classics of the decade. They ought to give the vastly overplayed hits from the 80s a little rest. You know what I'm talking about. Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer, Van Halen's Jump, Journey's Don't Stop Believing, Toto's Africa, to name a few. I love those songs, but 40 years later, we hear these songs more than we did when they came out. Uh, I mean, some of my favorite songs ever, that's why they're overplayed. But these six songs are hidden gems of the neon decade, and they're definitely underplayed, and they deserve some time in the spotlight. And I think you'll want to add them to your playlist, and you'll like them. Now, my criteria here is that they had to be hitting their day. I do allow myself one mulligan, though. That's for a song that definitely should have been a hit. Let's get started. Let's get into it. So coming in at number six, I've got one of the most magical songs of the decade. One of the coolest songs of the 80s. One that was produced by David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. Talking about Life in a Northern Town by the Dream Academy. Life in a Northern Town. Now the Dream Academy was a British band comprised of singer, songwriter, guitarist, Nick Laird Clues, keyboardist Gilbert Gabriel, and multi-instrumentalist Kane St. John. Formed in 1983, this band released their self-titled debut album in November of 1985. They also had two really great songs on Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the movie. Every time you go, great debut album. Pink Floyd's David Gilmore actually helped produce uh, this debut album with Laird Clues. Uh, elevating the sound of the British trio to new heights. I mean, if you've got David Gilmour in your corner, you know it's going to be pretty epic. Uh, what can I say about this album? The whole thing is really great. It features grand orchestrations, a fear of choir-like backing vocals, and contemporary synths, all of which can be heard in the LP's lead-off single, Life in a Northern Town, one of the best songs to come out that year. Nick Larry Clues and Gilbert Gabriel penned this track as a tribute to the late singer Nick Drake, who tragically died in 1974 at the age of just 26. Drake's profound musical contributions left a lasting impact on numerous British musicians that came out during the 80s, 
Instead of me regurgitating it though, I had the privilege of interviewing Nick Larry Clues about life in a northern town and he told me about the meaning behind the poetic lyrics and how David Gilmour of Pink Floyd and Paul Simon played pivotal roles in helping him realize the song's full potential. Here's a taste of it and you can see the whole thing, I'll link to it below. The one thing David Gilmour had told me when I was in the act was, your music will be as good as it can be due to the amount that you go with what you believe in. And the amount that you allow the engineer or the producer in the studio to change your vision is the amount that it will be less good. And that gave me this thing, which meant that for the first two bands, you know, for the first of the band, after he told me that, I was an absolute, you know, nobody wanted to work with me. I said, well, you know, I, that's not right. The sound is not the way I hear it, you know, all that stuff. Um, yeah, and he gave me carte blanche to do that. So when he said, do you produce it? And we told Warner Brothers and they said, okay, yeah, you do that. And, um, and then David came and said, I think these, we could put real strings on this or why don't we bring a percussionist in? So it was a, it was a brilliant way of working. Such a beautiful song. Okay, for my number five pick, I'm going with the least known hit from the classic album 1984, talking about I'll Wait by the mighty Van Halen. I'll Wait was actually the second single from Van Halen's 12 million plus selling album, 1984. It followed Jump, and you know, Jump always gets all the love. But I want to make the case here for I'll Wait. Both songs are heavy on synths, which uh, was a new direction for the band, kind of. The wrist alienating some of the Van Halen fandom. But in the long run, it proved to be a pivotal move for the band. I'll Wait begins as a typical love song, but we soon learn that the object of our narrator's affection isn't someone he knows personally. Now in true DLR, Diamond Dave, David Lee Roth fashion, the song is referencing a girl he saw in a magazine advertisement. And the connection between the two is completely imaginary. Now according to ClassicVanHalen.com, I'll Wait is about a girl wearing men's underwear in a Calvin Klein print media ad. Roth tacked the picture next to a Sony TV and addressed the lyrics to her. I'm coming straight for your heart. No way you can stop me now. No way you can stop me now. Verse 2 finds our narrator realizing his obsession is 100% one-sided, but he still remains hopelessly obsessed. While she watches, I can never be free. Such good photography. Roth, however, didn't write this one alone. Many of you probably know this, but if you don't, I'll Wait was Van Halen's first track to feature input from an outside writer. The song was actually a collaboration between Van Halen and former Doobie Brothers vocalist and keyboardist, the great Michael McDonald. Diamond Dave was struggling to write a chorus hook for the song, so producer Ted Templin brought in Michael McDonald to brainstorm some different ideas. Can you imagine that? As McDonald recalled, Van Halen had cut the track. The chord progression and the arrangement was already recorded and they needed some lyrics and a melody to go over that. Ted asked me to help out, so I sat down with David Lee Roth in Ted's office at Warner Brothers and wrote out a lyric. Now the details of this collaboration have been somewhat controversial thanks to Eddie Van Halen, who actually claimed that Templeman secretly recorded McDonald's ideas and passed them on to Roth. Eddie's adversarial relationship with Diamond Dave and Templeman may have colored his perception and his memory of what actually happened. In truth, there was not a secret tape or secret tapes. It's also true that the original copies of All Weight didn't give Michael McDonald credit, forced him to apply some legal pressure, said McDonald, and I quote, I guess they thought I was Santa Claus because I had to go chasing them a little bit on that one. It's a sinister song and one of the most memorable of their 80s output, now, I'll Wait actually went pretty high. It went number 13 on the Billboard Hot 100, second biggest song from the album. I'll Wait is also, it just doesn't sound like anything Van Halen ever did. Very cool song. So for my number four pick, I'm going with a bottle lightning indie synth pop band from the UK called Fruer and their inaugural single, Dude Dude. <laughs> 
this is one of those times where I'm going to break my own rule. This is just such a great song. Frewer is known for featuring Carl Hyde and Rick Smith, who went on to compose some of the most influential electronic dance music of the 90s as Underworld. Some people don't know that. At the outset, Hyde and Smith collaborated as Screen Gems with a Z in the early 80s after meeting in college in Cardiff Wells. Later, they formed Frewer with guitarist Alfie Thomas. Uh, Brian Burroughs would also join them on the drum kit, and so would keyboardist slash graphics guru John Warwicker. So the band's name was written as a hieroglyphic squiggle, which puzzled critics and listeners alike. This was an approach that would later be similarly uh, replicated by Prince on his 1992 album Love Symbol and several of his other albums going forward, you know, the symbol. Hieroglyphic squiggles aside, though, Frewer scored a minor hit with Doot Doot from their debut album. Uh, actually, it was called Doot Doot in 83. <laughs> The single went to number 59 in the UK, number 36 in the Netherlands, number 24 in Germany, number 17 in New Zealand, and number one in Italy. But it was missing in action here in the States. So a lot of uh, you American viewers out there might be unfamiliar with this one. But then again, you might have heard it in a few movies or TV shows. It's actually showed up on a couple. Tom Cruise's Vanilla Sky in 2001, Gossip Girl in 2009, Let Me In in 2010, and Take Me Home Tonight in 2011. Because it's 80s magic. I mean, truly, so magical, so mesmerizing, this song. When I was in high school, just to get my hands on the song, I paid 250 bucks at an import shop called Modified Records uh, in Salt Lake City. I was from Idaho. I traveled there to get it on import. This was, of course, before streaming, well before Napster. It was a lot of money to come by in the early 90s for a poor freshman, but it was well worth it. I put it on just about every mixtape I made from there forward. Now to follow up uh, Doot Doot, they did three more singles from the debut album, though none of them would actually chart. Then in 86, Fruer released a second album called Get Us Out of Here, which was withheld from release in the UK. That one also featured three singles, but once again, none of these would chart. Doot Doot was pretty much it for this band. Now, as I mentioned, the band would later reemerge as the electronic band Underworld, you know, after undergoing some lineup changes and signing a new recording contract. Uh, of course, they're best known for Born Slippy, which was featured in Train Spotting. That one reached number two in 1996 on the UK singles chart. Underworld is really great. Um, Born Slippy didn't make a lot of headway here in the States. It's topped out at number 33 on the Dance Club chart. Also, I read that guitarist Rick Smith would also go on to play sessions for Prince. How's that for a twist? Hieroglyphics, right? All right, halfway through the chart at number three, I'm going with a group that was one of the leading purveyors of the later to be named genre, Sophistapop. Yeah, just like Yacht Rock, Sophistapop. I'm um, talking about Swing Out Sister with their song Breakout. Don't hesitate, break out. Now, Swing Out Sister was formed in 85 in Manchester, England by keyboardist Andy Connell and drummer uh, Martin Jackson. They were joined by my junior high crush singer, Corrine Drury, who was previously a fashion designer. Their debut album, It's Better to Travel, hit number one on the British album charts in 1987. However, it would top out at number 40 on the Billboard 200 here in the States, but that was quite the headway for this band. The LP would feature five singles, two of which would break the top 40 here. Twilight World reached number 31 and Breakout went all the way to number six. Uh, as well as number 12 on the dance charts and number one on the adult contemporary chart. So it was big here. But there would be some drama leading up to Swing Out Sister's breakout success. True drama. Corrine actually wrote this one while she was recovering from a life-threatening horse riding accident. As she said, and I quote, I'd never written any songs before, but the music suggested things to me and I took words that I'd written down just after I'd you know, had the fractured skull. I'd been unconscious for a week and then spent three months recuperating. 
As you can imagine, I was in quite a delirious state and the lyrics were quite interesting, but they were just stream of consciousness things. But if that wasn't enough pressure, Swing Out Sister was signed to a two song deal with Mercury Records at that time. And you know, their first single, Blue Mood, that had stiffed completely. It didn't break into the Hot 100 or any other chart for that matter. Mercury actually told the band to finish their second demo immediately or they were gonna get dropped from the label. It had to be a hit. And you know, it's usually that this kind of pressure, greatness comes. And you know what? It was under the state of duress with Corrine uh, recovering from a fractured skull and a tight deadline that she crafted Breakout. So get this, with just a half hour left until she had to turn over the tape to the, the, the record company, Corrine was sitting in her apartment, singing things into a mic that was plugged into the back of her stereo. She was just trying to figure it out. Now in hindsight, she would say that the lack of time brought out the best in her. But you know, talk about cutting it close. She finished writing Breakout just in the nick of time. Said Corrine, and I quote, I think if anyone had seen how it all came about, they would never have taken it seriously. Swing Out Sister has since gone on to release a total of 10 studio albums. Their most recent was in 2017. And they've also scored six top 40 hits in the UK, so very big over there. You might also remember their American adult contemporary hit, Am I the Same Girl? That one climbed to number one on the AC charts in 1992 here. There's just no denying that Breakout. It made everything possible for Swing Out Sister. It set the tone for this band's career, and it's one of the best songs in 1987. So coming in at number two, I have one of the bands who have one of the most overplayed songs ever. I've mentioned it. Song that's one of the biggest rock songs ever. In fact, some say it's the biggest. But I'm gonna go with one of their lesser known hits here. Talking about Journey with Only the Young. But since he met the girl of his dreams, all he can think of is her shape. Honestly, Only the Young might be my favorite Journey song ever. Only the Young, that was originally recorded for Journey's 1983 Frontiers album. Now, surprisingly, it was voted off at the last minute, if you can believe that. It was a top 10 hit. Song was later released as a single on the soundtrack for the movie Vision Quest in 85, and you know, it gained notoriety for being played in its entirety in the movie. <laughs> Journey keyboardist Jonathan Cain explained the idea behind Only the Young when he said, we were raised on radio. You know, Motown, Bob Seger, The Four Tops, those kinds of things, they're parts of our lives. So that's all the way we sound. Young people are our future, and if our music reaches them, if they like you or even know you, that's an honor. That's why we wrote Only the Young. It was to, you know, to pay homage to the youth, their positivity, their freshness, their, you know, they're unjaded. They just want to rock. But the story of the song, it goes a lot deeper than that. This is one of my favorite rock and roll stories of the 80s. Through the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the band connected with a 16-year-old Journey fan named Kenny. Uh, he was fighting cystic fibrosis really for his entire life. His one wish was to one day meet his favorite band, Journey. So the band set up a hospital visit and flew to Cleveland to meet Kenny. Now when Journey arrived, it was clear that Kenny was in a tremendous amount of pain. But no one in the band, they really, they just didn't understand the extent of Kenny's condition. His body at that time was just hours away from failing. Journey had only the young queued up on a cassette tape on a Walkman. Now at this point, no one outside of the band, outside of Journey, had ever heard the song before. So putting the headphones over Kenny's ears, the band watched as Kenny listened intently to this unreleased song. And as it played, his eyes just got really big. Moments later, he looked up again and he realized the band was actually there with him. He was amazed. That was Kenny struggled for air. All five band members felt breathless themselves. They were grieving for this poor young soul. 
for this van. Said Steve Perry in a quote, soon as I stepped out of that hospital room, I lost it. Nurses had to take me to a room by myself. Now, sadly, that night, Kenny passed away. He listened to the song on repeat up until his death. Jordan was deeply affected by this experience, and it inspired them to open all of their concerts on the Raised on Radio tour with this song, dedicating it to Kenny. Just an amazing story. Okay, so we've arrived at my number one pick. For my top pick, I've got to go with a song that I'm shocked has not been used more in pop culture. It's just so cinematic. It's so eerie. It's creepy. It's haunting. It's so many things. Talking about Bruce Springsteen's I'm on Fire. Ooh, I'm on fire. Now, Springsteen came up with I'm on Fire in February of 82 during recording sessions for Nebraska. Bruce was playing around with a slow Johnny Cash rhythm, which he then put to some lyrics that he'd already written. The song was recorded in May of 1982 for possible release on Nebraska. That's when it was the Electric Nebraska. However, it was put on the end of side one on Born in the USA, and that was finished in 84. Daddy home, did he go and leave you all alone? To be candid, I'm on Fire is Springsteen's most sexually saturated song. I'm on Fire blends a soft rockabilly beat and ethereal synthesizers. But man, this song is truly, truly chilling. You can't find a top 10 hit in the 80s with lyrics this graphic or with music this atmospheric. When the boss says, you know, sometimes it's like someone took a knife, baby, edgy, and dull and cut a six inch valley through the middle of my skull or soul, depending on what version you listen to. Baby, edgy, and dull and cut a six inch valley through the middle of my skull. And then he says, at night I wake up with a sheet soaking wet and a freight train running through the middle of my head. Only you can cool my desire. My you can cool my desire. So it's always made me wonder, every time I hear this song, is this the words of a love song or of a serial killer? <laughs> and that's not even to mention the high-pitched howling at the end of the song. Uh, it sounds like a wounded animal yearning for its prey. Released in February 1985 is the fourth single out of seven from Born in the USA. I'm on Fire peaked at number six in the US, went to number five in the UK, and it went to number one in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Ireland. Ooh, I'm on fire. Yeah, if you remember the music video for this one, it lays out the story. The singer is an auto mechanic who burns for an upper class married woman. You know, she keeps bringing in, in her car for him to service. She asked for our friend here personally. Just like the way he rotates his tires. One night he drops off her car and he considers ringing her bell, but ultimately he thinks better of it. We never really see the face of the woman in the video. It's kind of like in Tom and Jerry when you see the legs. <laughs> it would imply that she was just a fantasy, of course. I'm on Fire won Best Mel Video at the second MTV Video Music Awards in 85. But the song is truly a masterwork of the 80s. Ooh, I'm on fire. So there you have it. My six picks for the greatest hidden gems that should take over for these other overplayed ditties, just for a while. What do you think? What are your picks? Again, I'm not making fun of any of these overplayed songs. I love them. It's just sometimes you can hear a song too much. That's why we have these six. I hope you'll add them to your playlist. What do you think of them? What are your six? What are some songs? I should have made them eight for the 80s. Anyway, I'll do that next time. Would you like to see a sequel to this? What should I do, the 60s or 70s? Let me know in the comments. Let's have a great discussion. Uh, if you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.